Now, suppose you really like home reno. Oh. Sorry. Look! We're safe! And sci-fi. Oh. <laughs> Sorry. But you don't want to pay for wrestling. Alright. Watch more of the channels you want, and you could pay less for those you don't with MTS TV. Get more theme groups to choose from for more choice of the channels you want. Preview it free for 30 days. It's just one of the many services from MTS. Subscribe today, and you could win a trip for two to Hollywood. Now you can make your own meals at KFC. Introducing KFC's Mixin' Meals. Meals made just for you. Order any individual chicken meal and pick any two sides of your choice. Fries, salads, vegetables, or mashed potatoes. So what do you feel like today? KFC's Mixin' Meals. There's more in the bucket. Tough as 10-gauge steel scraping on a granite slab. Tough is the world's only 800 EFI with monster torque and dual exhaust. Tough is built-in storage that protects your gear. The 2005 Sportsman ATVs. Ride free for a year and save up to $500 on a new Polaris ATV during the Polaris Test Ride event going on now. Polaris, the world's toughest ATVs. The exclusive North American premiere of the new cult classic, Doctor Who. Premieres Tuesday, April 5th on CBC Television. From CBC News, Canada Now. I'm Krista Erickson in Winnipeg. Tonight, a nation remembers. Today, Canada mourns the loss of four of her sons who paid the supreme price. Paying tribute to the fallen RCMP officers, a national memorial in Edmonton, and a special service here in Manitoba. I think it's given us, myself included, a chance to uh, take some time and think about our, our brothers that fell in Alberta. And sign showdown. I don't think you should be concerned about something until you know what it is. The fight over the Salisbury House restaurant on the bridge isn't over yet. The Francophone community hires a lawyer. I'm Ian Hanneman Singh. Jackson on trial. Arriving late provokes the judge as his accuser returns to the stand. Good evening. Thousands of mourners gathered in Edmonton today. They remembered the four officers who were gunned down last week. A sea of red filled the auditorium. Mounties traveled from across the country to be a part of the service. Police from across North America were also there, paying tribute to Constables Peter Sheeman, Leo Johnston, Anthony Gordon, and Brock Myrall. They were all killed by a gunman on a farm in Meyerthorpe, Alberta, killed by a man known as a cop hater with a violent past. In our national anthem, we sing, we stand on guard for thee. The men and women of the RCMP and their chosen vocation serve and guard this great nation from evil and lawlessness, and sometimes in the course of their duties are called upon to make that ultimate sacrifice. And the way I will always describe and think of Leo my brother, my best friend, and the most important person in my life. Here in Manitoba, RCMP officers who wanted to go to the service but couldn't attend held their own. It was a private memorial and at times very emotional. Jason Morton was there. The Royal Canadian Mounted Police is in mourning. They came together to grieve the loss of four of their own. Hundreds of RCMP officers from across the province, guests and politicians took part in a special ceremony. For many, it was an important part in the healing process. Since this has happened, um, it's been surreal. I think this has given us a chance to sit down and listen and, um, and take a moment for them. Four men were added to the roles of the fallen. 
When images of the four fallen officers came on the screen, many, like Constable Gail McDonald, broke down. It was very emotional. For me, uh, it's hard not to think about it. It's been on the news every day, and you never know when it could happen to yourself or, or a friend. RCMP did not grieve alone. The Aboriginal community sang a special song to honour the journey of the spirit of the four fallen officers. As well, Winnipeg police and military personnel from across the province showed their support. Incidents like this kind of brings the police community a little bit tighter. Of course, we wanted to come in and, and pay our respects to, to the RCMP uh, on behalf of the military. Though closed to the public, the support civilians showed the RCMP did not go unrecognized. We were particularly touched by the many flowers and cards that were left by the RCMP cenotaph at the front of our building. This was Corporal Shelley Anderson's second memorial service in four years. She served with Officer Dennis Strongquill, who was shot in 2001. She says that these ceremonies are important during these times. So you get the sense that you're not the only one and there are other people. And uh, as I've heard many times, we are um, a family, a police family. A family who hopes ceremonies like these will help them get a sense of closure. Jason Morton, CBC News, Winnipeg. And we'll have more on the Edmonton Memorial a little later in the program. Well, just how far can advertising go on public spaces? Francophones are asking that question at the moment. They're also raising it as an issue with the city. It seems they remain concerned about plans to build a Salisbury House restaurant on a bridge in St. Boniface, so concerned that they've hired a lawyer. Ian Flett reports. Here's our city's newest icon. Unique and modern, it bridges Winnipeg's English and French-speaking communities. And soon, maybe even this summer, you'll be able to pick up a burger and frites at a Salisbury House halfway between. The Société Franco-Manitobain was displeased by a Salz on the bridge, but it says it's come to accept it as a fait accompli, with one exception. It doesn't want any Salisbury House signs on the bridge and says the company can advertise in other ways. What we're trying to do is really uh, make sure that um, the signage uh, does not affect the integrity, uh, the overall look and integrity of Esplanade Riel. The SFM hired a lawyer to look into ways of forcing the city to keep the bridge sign free. Daniel Boucher is concerned the restaurant will install a big sign and ruin the iconic value of the Esplanade. It's like the Eiffel Tower. I mean, you, you, if you put a big McDonald's on the Eiffel Tower, people will start focusing on the McDonald's. The Eiffel Tower had a sign. It was for Citron Motor Company. The French car maker had its sign and lights on the Parisian icon almost a century ago. The sign came down when the car maker started failing. The Eiffel Tower has not been used as a billboard since. As for the Esplanade, the mayor says wait and see. I don't think you should be concerned about something until you know what it is. So maybe everybody should just sit back and wait and listen and learn. Ultimately, what happens depends on the city's administrators, but they're treading into uncharted waters. Since the soon-to-be restaurant is over water, not land, it's not zoned. There is an urban design review, and they will review signage, any alterations to the plaza to ensure that it respects uh, vistas, uh, historical uh, components, and important sites, and they'll look at it for materials, colors, complementing the architecture. That review is looked at by the Director of Planning, Property and Development for a decision. That process is not public, but the decision can be appealed. Ian Flett, CBC News, Winnipeg. We contacted Salisbury House for comment today, and no one was available to speak with us. More questions tonight about the NDP government's health care plans. Yesterday, the province redirected millions to improve wait times for hip and knee surgery. But today, the opposition brought up a previous plan unveiled by the government and questioned why that one hasn't materialized. The CBC's Richard Madden explains. Walter Wright came to the legislature looking for answers. Why must his 82-year-old wife wait more than a year for hip surgery and what can be done to speed it up? All I can say is it is terrible. It's just a sickness that you cannot cope with. It's physical. Allow at least 1,000 uh, additional procedures to be done 
Although the NDP government just redirected $10 million from Ottawa to conduct more hip and knee surgeries and reduce waiting times, the opposition says patients like Walter Wright shouldn't hold their breath. Because last November, the province announced more than half a million dollars to Manitoba's Central Health Authority, where 65 more hip and knee surgeries would be performed at the Boundary Trails Health Centre in Winkler. But four months later, those surgeries have yet to occur. Hospital, not one hip or knee replacement for the money that has been spent to date has taken place. At Boundary Trails? At Boundary Trails. Boundary Trails Health Centre admits, in reality, the expanded surgeries can't begin until April because they needed to find more staff. But Stephenson says it's another example of NDP spin. How can patients in this province trust this Premier and the Minister of Health when they provide nothing but false hope for patients in this province? We have an unacceptable wait time for hips and knees. We need to improve that record. The Health Minister says it takes time to implement the changes, but he says he'll look into why the surgeries haven't happened in Winkler. We expect when a, when a regional health authority or a hospital makes a commitment to do additional surgeries, they will do them. And if they aren't able to do them for good or whatever reasons, then we'll transfer those resources to where they can be done. Meantime, Walter Wright says he has no choice but to wait and remain optimistic. I have to have hope. So I have hope that what I'm hearing to, today at the ledge is something for sure that's going to happen, and shortly. It's unclear when his wife will eventually get her surgery, but the province says it'll be sooner than previous years. Richard Madden, CBC News, Winnipeg. More questions for the federal government today, not about wait times, but about Zonalite. It's the insulation that was put into homes from the 1950s until the 1990s. During question period today, a Manitoba MP asked the government about cleaning up sites that were once Zonalite plants. The insulation contains asbestos, a cancer-causing agent. An estimated 200,000 Canadian homes have Zonalite, and there are a number of locations across the country, including here in Winnipeg, that used to produce it. The federal government is doing absolutely nothing to remediate the 10 Zonalite plants in 10 cities across the country. Why have they taken no action about Zonalite? Why are they afraid to admit there is no safe level of asbestos? Why aren't they cleaning these hazardous sites up? Here, yeah. here. Yeah. Federal Housing and Labour Minister Joe Fontana did not answer the question directly. He did say the government is concerned about safety and is monitoring the situation. Manitobans who have cancer won't have to wait as long for treatment. Cancer Care Manitoba is getting a new linear accelerator by next year. The machine uses x-ray beams to destroy or shrink cancer cells. Right now the province has six of the machines, but some cancer patients are still waiting up to four weeks for treatment. The province says the machine will help get wait times down. Five years ago we were sending people out of province for treatment. We don't do that anymore because we have the capacity the new machine will cost $2.6 million and it's being paid for with federal money, but it won't be up and running until the middle of 2006. The province has to build a room to house the machine. Well, the cold weather is good for at least one thing. It helped in the testing of a new hydrogen bus here in Winnipeg. The $1.4 million bus was built by a number of companies, including Manitoba's New Flyer Industries. It burns hydrogen gas, which is a cleaner fuel. The bus was being tested in California before being shipped to Winnipeg for cold weather testing. It traveled more than 500 kilometers and carried more than 1,000 passengers during the tests. The province says this could be the way of the future. And a potential hydrogen economy means a lot for Manitoba. We have an abundance of, electro, uh, of hydroelectricity. We have an abundance of water. The future of a hydrogen economy will bode very well for a province like ours. To Ian now with other stories ahead in the hour. Thanks, Krista. We'll have more on the memorials for the four RCMP officers, including full coverage from the Edmonton ceremony attended by thousands of police officers. And the Michael Jackson trial in California. Strange twist. Jackson turned up late in his pajamas to hear testimony from the teenager he's accused of molesting. All highways are now open across the province, but that wasn't the case this morning. The Trans-Canada between Headingley and Winnipeg was closed for most of the day. It finally opened up just after 1 o'clock this afternoon. Wind was a big problem on the highways. It produced icy sections throughout the southern part of the province. Police are still urging caution for anyone travelling on the highways. Well, the chance of more snow tonight making those highways even worse, perhaps. Uh, there is also some weather warnings to tell you about. A blizzard warning in effect for the Churchill region. 
and a wind chill warning in effect for northern Manitoba tonight. But let's take a look now at the current conditions in Winnipeg. Right now it is minus 3 under cloudy skies, but with the wind chill it feels like minus 11. The wind is coming from the northwest at 33 kilometers per hour and we'll have the extended forecast for you in a short while. Still to come on Canada now, the four fallen officers had close relationships with the people they protected. Next, we talked to some former Manitoba RCMP who also had special relationships with the communities they served. That's next. The exclusive North American premiere of the new cult classic, Doctor Who, premieres Tuesday, April 5th on CBC Television. It's out with the old and in with the new as The Brick presents its greatest sale of the season. New spring merchandise is arriving daily and The Brick must make room. Everything is on sale, including no GST on all furniture and mattresses. So there are some really tall people at this party. <laughs> Whoa! Whoa! Oh. Not sure if I got that last shot, guys. Can we try that again? Film and send the moment as it happens with a video phone from MTS Mobility. Plus, get two months of unlimited video and picture messaging. MTS Mobility. Your phone works here. When in Winnipeg for business, a family retreat, or shopping, visit the Clarion Hotel Suites and Spa at Polo Park. At the Clarion, where luxuries are standard, we offer spacious executive rooms and suites. And for a romantic getaway, book one of our 12 theme rooms. With 20,000 square feet of banquet and conference facilities, the Clarion will exceed your expectations. Enjoy Manitoba's largest indoor theme water park and mineral spa. For reservations, call the Clarion Hotel Suites and Spa. It's out with the old and in with the new as The Brick presents its greatest sale of the season. New spring merchandise is arriving daily and The Brick must make room. Everything is on sale, including no GST on all furniture and mattresses. When we said the Nicoderm patch has smart technology, we didn't mean you could use it as a cell phone. Hello? Or even play music. What we meant was only Nicoderm has patented Smart Dose technology. Nicoderm with Smart Dose gives you smooth, steady delivery of the active ingredient. That helps control the cravings when you're quitting smoking. <clears throat> That's uh, one smart patch. You can double your chances of success with Nicoderm, the number one recommended stop smoking aid by doctors and pharmacists. See at Brandon's Royal Manitoba Winter Fair. Drop by the CBC booth and listen to stories and live interviews on Radio Noon. Come visit with Haley of Kids CBC. Plus, we'll have prizes and much more at the CBC booth at the Winter Fair. See you there. Welcome back. As we told you earlier, memorials were held across the country for the officers killed in Alberta. Here in Manitoba, the RCMP has dealt with its own tragedies. Over the years, 20 Mounties have been killed in the line of duty in this province. And this week, we sat down with some retired Mounties. They reflected on the dangers of the job and how they're coping with the latest deaths. The grim scene at a farm near Marathorpe, Alberta, is a sober reminder for Canadians. The deaths of four young RCMP officers forced the country to focus on the danger of being a member of the law enforcement community. And while the country pays its respects, retired and current police officers are coming to grips with the tragedy. Manitoba has a special link to the Royal Canadian Mounted Police. The RCMP were born in the West. It was first known as the Northwest Mounted Police, organized by the federal government to police Saskatchewan and Manitoba in the late 1800s. Seen here in a reenactment, they brought some order to the lawless Wild West. By 1920, the Northwest Mounted Police reorganized and became the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, eventually policing the entire country. While society has continued to change, the RCMP's duties remain virtually the same, keeping law and order and maintaining some of the tradition and ceremony that made them famous around the world. But the nature of their work can be dangerous, and sometimes their members have paid the ultimate price for their commitment to the force. 21-year-old Robert Thomas, a special constable, was killed instantly by a rifle blast. 20 members of the RCMP have been killed in the line of duty in Manitoba. It's just like losing a member of your family. 
Jack Templeman is a retired Winnipeg police officer and the curator of the police museum. He's carefully chronicled the history and the sacrifice that law enforcement officers have made throughout Manitoba's history. In Manitoba, there have been 46 uh, police officers and peace officers uh, all together. Uh, we hold a memorial service now at the last Sunday of uh, September every year, and the tribute is paid to all 46 officers. 20 RCMP have died since uh, the beginning of Manitoba. Sure, the history of the service and the risks of the job are not lost on retired yeah. Corporal Carl Purchase and retired Sergeant Jim Coburn. They both policed in small communities, just like the Force Lane officers in Alberta. I was in the Mount of Police for 28 years, and I served throughout Manitoba from the northern right to the southern border. I served in Gillam, Churchill, Shimadawa, the Paw, Thompson, Lavodin, Cross Lake, Norios. I uh, went to uh, Island Lake temporary duty. I went to uh, Winnipeg Osis, I uh, went to Hamiota. I uh, started off in Morden, Manitoba, uh, and from there to Winnipeg, Winnipeg Detachment. And then I was in the Winnipeg Crime Lab for a while. Went to Selkirk, I was in Selkirk for a total of 12, 13 years. And from Selkirk to uh, commercial crime in Winnipeg, where I spent the last 13 years of my service. I think the best job in the force was working in a small community on the detachment. You got to know the people fairly quickly and fairly well, and you, um, you always saw the, the good side of the people in most cases. You were sort of a father figure to a lot of people. Um, you, you were supposed to have all the answers for the youth when they came forward with a lot of questions. You basically, uh, you were part of the core and the communities. Um, uh, often appreciated because in a lot of times, depending on where you were stationed, they didn't have that uh, type of facilitator uh, to be able to assist. So uh, the gratitude that was extended to you is overwhelming. For these men, despite the threat of danger, they were still compelled to become officers. And coping with the death of a fellow officer or approaching a potential crime scene is part of that work. I think it's a uh, perhaps just a natural uh, reaction, a sort of an immune process where you, you take the, those bad times, those stressful times, and you put them out of your mind and forget them and just go on. Uh, I think that's really how you, how you survive. I had an unfortunate incident uh, in my younger days. I had to shoot an individual. Thank God he didn't die. I say that in all sincerity. Um, but at the time, there wasn't a forced psychologist that I could go to. There were members that I could go to. You start training and they start telling you your life is on the line the day you walk out of this academy. Yeah, that's, a, that's a great burden to carry with you. But that burden hasn't gone unnoticed by the public. Makeshift tributes have sprung up across the country for the four officers gunned down in Alberta. It's nice to know that uh, uh, there's that uh, feeling of caring in the community that draws the people out and, and uh, and, and they, they actually do this. Jim Coburn no longer worries about the job's risks for himself. Now he worries about his son. He's also an RCMP officer. When I left the RCMP, I said to myself and my wife, well, I don't have to worry or be concerned anymore. The phone isn't going to ring. And when it does, it's just going to be one of the kids. And then my son joined the force. The phone rings again at 3, 4 o'clock in the morning. He phones, he talks. You're, you, you never walk away. You know, under those kind of circumstances. He's got to drop something on you and you, you talk it out and you talk it over. And um, when this incident happened, uh, as the Strong Quill incident, um, he's on my mind. But neither would change the paths they chose so many years ago. I have no regrets that I took the path I'd, I'd taken, none whatsoever. Um, I've said it many times before, if I was 28 years all over again, I know which door I'd be knocking on. Still to come on Canada Now, we'll let you know how Manitoba is doing at the Briar. That curling update is just ahead. The exclusive North American premiere of the new cult classic, Doctor Who, premieres Tuesday, April 5th on CBC Television. For the grand prize, what year did Canada adopt its official flag? 1966. I'm sorry. Want to try again? 1959. Nope. 
68, uh -uh. 67, no. 63, Higher. 64, no. 65. You nailed it! Yes. Wouldn't it be great if you had seven chances to win? You do with Special 7, the new scratch and win game. Seven great games and total prizing of 40 million with 20 top prizes of over $700,000. Special 7, get it while it lasts. Tough as 10 gauge steel scraping on a granite slab. Tough is the world's only 800 EFI with monster torque and dual exhaust. Tough is built-in storage that protects your gear. The 2005 Sportsman ATVs. Ride free for a year and save up to $500 on a new Polaris ATV during the Polaris Test Ride event going on now. Polaris, the world's toughest ATVs. Oh, hello. You already know Excel makes great gum. Well, today I'm thrilled to announce that Excel now comes in mints. I urge you to try them. Ooh, like he's doing. Mmm, refreshing. <laughs> Whoa. Yup. Hi. Mmm, refreshing. Yes, you'll be irresistible when you accelerate your breath with new Excel mints. Does your glyphosate deliver better absorption? Translocation and an advanced delivery system. If not, then move up to Touchdown IQ. Touchdown IQ's unique adjuvant drives deep to the root of the problem. Choose the premium glyphosate that goes the distance. Touchdown IQ delivers. Tomorrow morning at about 5 to 8, Dean Jenkins and the headliner will be by. And I just got off the phone with Dean and he's still writing the song. Find out what it's about tomorrow morning. CBC Radio 1, 990. Manitoba's Randy Dutame is in a good position at the Canadian Men's Curling Championship in Edmonton. He won another game this morning, defeating Ontario's Wayne Maddaw by a score of 7-4. The victory assures Manitoba a berth in the Briar playoffs. It gave them a stellar record of eight wins and two losses. Manitoba played Newfoundland this afternoon in its final game of the round robin. Well, we would like to take a moment to congratulate a number of people from our news team. They are winners of a Gracie Award honoring stories about women. The award for best news story went to a feature report that we did on Miriam Taves, the Manitoba author. It looked back at her book of fiction that brewed a quiet controversy in her hometown. Although it's a short trip from her home in Winnipeg, for Taves, it's an uneasy journey. She's worried about the reaction to her latest book, A Complicated Kindness. It was inspired by her hometown, and it does not paint the religious community in a flattering light. People here just can't wait to die, it seems. It's the main event. The only reason we're not all snuffed at birth is because that would reduce our suffering by a lifetime. Barbara Brunzel was the reporter on that story. The producer was Terry Stapleton. It was edited by Dale Foster and photographed by Neil Carlton, and Ron Sloan did the graphics. Congratulations to all of our immensely talented colleagues. Pet owners will tell you that having a dog or a cat around has countless benefits. One of them is sometimes saving lives. We've all heard the stories of heroic dogs or cats credited with saving their owners from fire or drowning. But here's a story that's going to be hard to top. The CBC's Cynthia Kent has more. Georgina Bramwell loves dogs. She and her husband Robert have three, and they consider them family. But for the Bramwells, one-year-old teddy bear is something special. It was him that saved my life. Georgina believes if it wasn't for Teddy Bear, she never would have found the lump in her breast in time. About a month before Christmas, he started this digging and going on, and I couldn't figure out what was going. Damn, but he wouldn't leave me alone. This time he was there and he was rough with me. He jumped on my breast and it was sore. So I said, I'm going to go to sleep. I hauled the blanket up over me and I'm going to go to sleep. This next time he jumped, he was severe. So I said, you hurt me. So he's standing back looking at me, and he's not saying a word, he's just standing there. And, and uh, I felt my breast, and I had a lump. Georgina had a mastectomy and was told by her doctor that they'd caught the cancer before it spread. After I came home, everything, he never smelt no more, never did nothing. He's just a normal dog. Her husband, Robert, doesn't care that some people don't believe it. 
the dog to us is a hero, and he saved my life, the life of my wife, and uh, I'm so proud of him, you know. And the Bramwells are not alone in their belief. British researchers are testing dogs' ability to detect cancer in urine. And while science may still be a long way away from determining whether dogs can detect cancer, the Bramwells have all the proof they need. Cynthia Kent, CBC News, Waverly. Time now for the three-day forecast, and we begin in northwestern Ontario. A few flurries ending in the morning on Friday, the temperature falling to minus 16 in the afternoon, but with the wind chill, it's going to feel like minus 30. On Saturday, a mix of sun and cloud, the high minus 8, and on Sunday, a 60% chance of flurries, the high minus 5. For northern Manitoba, sunny on Friday, the high minus 15, but with the wind chill, it will feel like minus 41. On Saturday, a mix of sun and cloud, the high warming up to minus 5. And on Sunday, a 60% chance of flurries, the high expected minus 12. For central Manitoba and the Dauphin area, sunny on Friday, the high minus 14, but with the wind chill minus 39. On Saturday, sunny with a high of minus 3, much warmer. And on Sunday, a 60% chance of flurries, the high minus 8. For southwestern Manitoba and the Brandon area, sunny on Friday, the high expected minus 6. On Saturday, sunny again with a high of minus 2. And on Sunday, a mix of sun and cloud, the high minus 4. And finally, for southeastern Manitoba and the Winnipeg area, sunny on Friday, the high minus 14, but with the wind chill minus 33. On Saturday, sunny again with a high of minus 6. And on Sunday, a 60% chance of flurries, the high minus 7. Time now to recap tonight's top stories. Thousands of mourners gathered in Edmonton today. They remembered the four officers who were gunned down last week. Mounties traveled from across the country to be a part of the National Service. Police from across North America were also there, paying tribute to Constables Peter Sheeman, Leo Johnston, Anthony Gordon and Brock Myrall. A separate service was held here in Manitoba for those officers who could not attend the Edmonton Memorial. And just how far can advertising go on public spaces? Francophones are asking that question at the moment. They're concerned about the sign that will be a part of the Salisbury House restaurant on the bridge in St. Boniface. In fact, they're so concerned that they've hired a lawyer. And that is the news from Winnipeg. Now to Ian Hanamansing in Vancouver for the rest of Canada now. He has the day's national and international news and more on the Edmonton Memorial. Good evening. It was one week ago we heard in disbelief that four young RCMP officers had been shot to death at a rural Alberta farm. Today, Constables Peter Sheeman, Leo Johnston, Anthony Gordon and Brock Myrall were mourned by a nation, remembered in an unprecedented memorial in the province where they gave their lives. James Cudmore reports. They were more than 8,000 strong, a procession of police officers from across the country and the continent, marching in remembrance of four colleagues murdered on an Alberta farm. The RCMP, as is fitting, were led by a colour party of mounted officers flying the force's guidon, a ceremonial flag bearing the regiment's battle honours. As the Mounties marched, police helicopters circled in the sky, and snipers kept watch over a parade that lasted 45 minutes from end to end. Anytime we have a fallen officer anywhere in the world, we certainly pay them honor, and you know, to have four at one time is unprecedented. Inside, a sea of red surge surrounded dignitaries, onlookers, and of course the families of the four dead officers. The Prime Minister, the Governor General, the Premier of Alberta, and the crowd all on their feet as the famed Stetson headdresses of those four young officers were carried inside. Constable Brock Myrell, Constable Peter Sheeman, Constable Leo Johnston, and Constable Anthony Gordon. They were remembered in song by Ian Tyson as four strong winds. Our good times are all gone And I'm bound for moving on they were remembered by the Governor General as protectors of peace. Most of us cannot truly understand what it means to embrace a profession that always holds the possibility of danger or death. We count ourselves blessed, though, that dedicated men and women take on this challenge, sustaining the peace, the freedom, the structure that we cherish.
by the Prime Minister as selfless men dedicated to their nation. These four young men, alive in the early summer of life, rest now in the serenity of God's embrace. And by the Premier of Alberta as the very best the province had. And may we never forget these uh, four men, their families, or their beautiful soaring spirits. And on behalf of the force, the Commissioner of the RCMP spoke directly to the families of the fallen. To you, I can only say, on behalf of the 23,000 men and women who proudly served as colleagues to your beloved, that we share with your grief. And it was Don Sheeman, father of Peter and a Lutheran minister, who spoke so as if for all the families eulogy. of their grief. The pain of our loss is beyond anything we could have ever imagined. Over and over again, people tell us that they could never begin to understand the depth of, their, of our loss. And that is true. And then the last post was played, followed by a minute's silence. And then Reveille calling the mourners to awaken from their grief. James Cudmore, CBC News, Edmonton. Smaller ceremonies were held across the country to honor the officers. Near Windsor, members of the RCMP carried pillows bearing Stetsons, representing the four constables. The ceremony took place at Lakeshore St. Andrew's Church. As well as members of the RCMP, peace officers from Ontario and Michigan were there. There are literally millions of Canadians and other citizens throughout the world that are entering into the sorrow that is felt by family, friends, members of the law enforcement community, regardless of what uniform they wear, and our country at large. And they will be in British Columbia, officers gathered at the RCMP division headquarters in Vancouver. Members watched the ceremony from Edmonton on TV. And in Regina, a private viewing of the memorial was held at the RCMP training depot. Saskatchewan-born Constable Brock Myrall graduated from the academy just last month. Three of the four officers killed were based in Mayerthorpe. Just 1,500 people live there. Many of them are still struggling to cope with the grief that has engulfed their town. Cameron McIntosh reports. At the crack of dawn at a makeshift memorial outside the Mayerthorpe detachment, RCMP members from around the region heading for Edmonton stopped to honour their fallen brothers. It was not an official act. But it was a scene repeated through the day by residents like Amy Blahoon who a week after the tragedy still feels numb. Well, it's obviously just really sad. You know, we're devastated. Um, you know, these are men who, you know, young, strong, um, men that were here to protect the community and just innocent, just doing their job, you know. The entire community of Marathorpe feels that way. The town, burdened by sorrow and anger, trying to come to grips with tragedy while trying to get back to a sense of normalcy. I'm quite emotional about it. It's... Uh... It's sad, you know, losing them. Uh, I have a son-in-law who's in the RCMP, and it, it hits home. The reminders here are constant. The red ribbons in shop windows. At the local high school, students released from class to watch the National Memorial in private. A scene similar to that in Leo Bablitz's hardware store, where the broadcast of the ceremony took priority over business. Like you can't never bring back somebody's life. I mean, there, there's going to be many sad days for many people. While the National Mourning Service may be over, the town of Marathorpe still has to pay its final respects. A town memorial service has been scheduled for Tuesday, as residents here hope to finally lay their slain officers to rest and begin the process of moving on. Cameron McIntosh, CBC News, Marathorpe, Alberta. The man who set himself on fire yesterday near the Ontario Legislature remains in serious condition in hospital tonight with severe burns. We still don't know what his motive was, but as James Murray reports, we did get a first-hand description of the scene today from firefighters. The pictures of yesterday's horror at the Ontario Legislature are disturbing, and they are being played repeatedly in Toronto. Accompanied by the questions, what was the man in the van thinking? And what were the firefighters thinking? Today, the answer to one of those questions. Firefighter Jeff Bingham was one of a team of emergency workers alongside the menacing rental van. 
You could see uh, gasoline coming out of the van when he'd open his door. Every time he rolled down his window, there's a very, very strong smell. Um, but they're at a farmer's protest, so, you know, we're always thinking worst situation. So we're thinking Oklahoma City bombing as well. In 1995, a bomb packed with fuel, oil, and fertilizer was used to destroy a building, killing 168 people. That bomb, too, was carried in a rental truck. Here, it seems, the driver, 50-year-old Ang Ngoc Vong, just had gasoline. None of the hundreds of people gathered at Queen's Park for a protest was hurt. The same can't be said for Ang Ngoc Vong. They brought in the ETF unit, so uh, they instructed us that they were going to break the windows. Smashing the window may have fractured the man's skull. He's in hospital, suffering from head wounds and severe burns. I was the guy that pulled him out of the van. No easy piece of work, according to Pete Bader. It's very, very hot. I know it, it doesn't seem like that when you're looking at it from a distance, but when you're actually there, I don't know if you saw in the video the initial door opening, everybody backed away. There was a lot of heat coming out of that door right away. We don't feel like heroes or anything. We're just doing our job. Firefighters are telling their stories, but the police are not, and they won't so long as the province's special investigations unit is looking into the incident. It investigates every time an arrest comes to a violent end. James Murray, CBC News, Toronto. Police in Laval are investigating a shootout in a nightclub that left two men dead. About 400 people were in the club when the shooting occurred at around 2 o'clock this morning. One witness recalled hearing loud popping noises followed by panic in the club. The two men were taken to hospital where they died of their wounds. It's not known if the men shot each other or if they were both shot by someone else. The RCMP is cracking down on smugglers using a path it says accounts for two-thirds of all illegal cigarette imports into Canada. Known as the Aquasasne Cornwall route, the ice bridge crosses the Canada-U.S. border. But despite increasing the number of busts, police have barely dented this lucrative and dangerous business. Matthew Pace reports with exclus exclusive pictures from our colleagues at Radio Canada. This ice bridge between Canada and the U.S. has become a highway for contraband. Mohawk police from Aquasasne, the Cilte de Quebec, and the RCMP chased three smugglers across the frozen St. Lawrence River at 120 kilometers an hour. The cops have an advantage, their chase directed from above. Still, the smugglers win this round. The RCMP's Gilles Tougat. They got away from us this time, he says, but we're going to learn from this. It appears police are learning. Officers seized 35 shipments of smuggled cigarettes in the first two months of this year. That's more than three times the number of busts made over the same period last year. The waterways and back roads through Aquasasne form one of the main smuggling corridors between Canada and the U.S. The cigarettes are manufactured on the American side. Despite their efforts, the Mounties say 20,000 cartons cross the border illegally every day. It's not just cigarettes. The smugglers are taking advantage of the frozen river to cart drugs, too. Police scan the shoreline with night vision goggles and heat detectors. They're often forced into high-speed chases. Christina King dodged police for five years. Loved every minute of it. I love the excitement of getting chased. And when you get away, they can't catch you. I just turn around and go like this. <laughs> the smugglers here are protected by organized criminal groups, and many others in the community just look away. I would say that in the, probably in the majority of our community, it is acceptable. Police say this is the biggest winter operation they've ever mounted here, and they say as the smugglers become better equipped, so will they. Matthew Pace, CBC News, Aquasusney, Ontario. Now here's a look at what's coming up. Tomorrow on Canada Now, have you ever heard of a bank that isn't driven by profit? A bank that doesn't care about making money? Well, a group of people in Winnipeg are trying to create one. A not-for-profit bank for people who have lost their financial institutions. In the last seven years, 11 banks in the North End have closed their doors. To find out who's behind the banking concept, join Ian Hanamansing and me for Canada Now, tomorrow at 6.
Michael Jackson's trial got off to a rocky start this morning. The singer arrived late after the judge threatened to have him arrested for failing to appear on time. After a long delay, proceedings finally began. And that's when Jackson's teenage accuser took the stand. Steve Futterman has more. Something was missing today when court was due to begin. The defendant, Michael Jackson, was nowhere to be seen. For the second time in the last two months, Jackson was afflicted with a sudden ailment. Today it was severe back pains. The judge immediately took a hard line. Either Jackson shows up or he'll be arrested and his $3 million bail would be revoked. When Jackson finally did arrive, he looked to be in pain. He walked slowly and was wearing pajama bottoms and slippers. When court resumed, the judge briefly explained the delay to the jurors. Then some of the most anticipated testimony of the trial from the accuser himself. The 15-year-old boy told jurors how Jackson first gave him some wine. The boy said the pop star referred to it as Jesus juice. How did it taste, the prosecutor asked. Ugly, the teenager replied. He said Jackson told him it would relax him. Late in the day, the boy detailed for the first time on the witness stand the election. Using explicit language, he described how he claims Jackson touched him. For CBC News, I'm Steve Futterman in Santa Maria, California. Chicago police say their investigation into the murders of a judge's family two weeks ago has taken an unexpected turn. Police thought it might have been a revenge attack carried out by white supremacists. But the focus of the investigation has changed after a man who killed himself this week left a note claiming to be the killer. The judge had ruled against the man in a medical malpractice lawsuit. Former U.S. President Bill Clinton is reported to be in good spirits after having major surgery this morning. Doctors removed fluid and scar tissue that built up in his lungs following heart bypass surgery six months ago. Clinton arrived at a New York hospital early this morning. Doctors describe his operation as a success and say the former president could be released as early as Sunday. This was a terribly sad day in a remote village in the Philippines. The village buried 27 of its children. They died of food poisoning after eating fried cassava, a snack they bought during a break from school. Most of the victims were between 7 and 13 years old. In all, 90 children ended up in hospital. It was a massive terrorist attack, the worst ever on Spanish soil. Tomorrow marks the first anniversary of the bombing of four commuter trains in Madrid. Nearly 200 people died and hundreds more were wounded. One year later, police are still investigating. Questions go unanswered. And as the CBC's Paul Workman reports, many commuters remain wary. The morning rush hour at Atocha station is busy and crowded, where Ampara Ortega normally gets off her train. A young woman who reflects on her fate almost every time she comes here. The moment a year ago when bombs went off and she made a frantic escape in the smoke and panic of an attack. For some reason, the bomb on her car didn't explode. I think about it every day, she says. I appreciate life so much more, my friends and my family. The attacks in Madrid on four separate trains killed 191 people, wounded 1,500, and left Spain fearful, unsettled, suspicious, and torn. The flowers and the candles at the station have been replaced by a high-tech memorial, where you leave a handprint and a message. Pedro Arroyo wrote of healing, a million unanswered questions and incomprehension. I would like to know exactly what it happened. And you don't feel that you do know yet? No. Almost a year to the day, an international conference with big names and big ideas issued the Madrid Convention, a plan to confront terrorism with greater unity, vigilance, and global cooperation. The United Nations must be at the forefront in fighting against it, and first of all, in proclaiming loud and clear that terrorism can never be accepted or justified in any cause whatsoever. Most Spaniards accept the idea that Islamist extremists, and only Islamist extremists, carried out the attacks. 
Ask Amparo Ortega why Madrid was a target. The war in Iraq, she says, Spain's support for the American invasion. And that issue continues to poison the country's mourning and healing. A year-long investigation has more or less collapsed in mistrust, accusation, and deep political division. So deep is the unease and ill feeling here that even the government's remembrance ceremony has fallen into squabbling. The victims' associations say they will not participate, refusing to become, in the words of their spokesperson, an anniversary photo opportunity. Paul Workman, CBC News, Madrid. Israeli troops killed a member of the Palestinian militant group Islamic Jihad this morning during a raid in the West Bank. Israeli soldiers cornered the man inside his house. When he didn't surrender, the army bulldozed the building, killing him in the process. The military says the man was connected to last month's suicide bombing in Tel Aviv. A Palestinian official says the attack could trigger more violence. Another suicide bomb attack today in Iraq, apparently targeting members of the Shia majority. As many as 47 people died when the explosion tore through a group of mourners at a funeral. <laughs> Shocked mourners tried to help the wounded as all around them lay remains of the dead. Medics say dozens of people survived the blast, but many were badly hurt. Officials suspect members of the Sunni minority in this latest attack. The president of Lebanon has reinstated former Prime Minister Omar Karimi, who resigned just 10 days ago. Karimi stepped down amid internal and international pressure following the assassination of Rafik Hariri. Karimi is supported by the Syrian government. And Hong Kong's chief executive, Tong Chi Hua, resigned today as expected. He says it's because of poor health and denies reports Beijing ousted him because of poor performance. Japan marked a difficult chapter in its history today, the 60th anniversary of a huge American firebombing of Tokyo. They held ceremonies to remember the 100,000 people killed in the 1945 attack. Buddhist monks chanted for peace at a memorial hall built near the center of the bomb district. People laid flowers and took a moment to remember the attack which leveled the capital. The raid was part of an American strategy to wear down Japanese morale and win the war. A powerful tornado hit a small town on the west coast of New Zealand this morning, causing major damage to dozens of homes and businesses. Residents say they were terrified when the sky suddenly changed. And all I saw behind me was just a huge, big black thing with iron and everything flying around in it. No one died as the storm swept through, but at least six people were injured. Still ahead, using credit instead of small change. That used to be quite rare, and uh, now I'd say we make 15 or 20 transactions like that a day. The big money in minor transactions. Relax. Moore's rents tuxedos starting at just $59.99. And our wide selection of the latest styles and accessories makes looking good as easy as it is affordable. Moore's. Well-made, well-priced, well-dressed. A wide stance keeps you steady on your feet. So mounting the shocks outside the frame widen the stance of the Ford F-150. It's the first pickup to do this. Good luck knocking this off its feet. We keep thinking about tough because we want you to drive a Ford. If your last encounter with fruit was on a Hawaiian shirt, you'll want to try this. Introducing the fresh fruit bowl and cup. Honeydew, cantaloupe, pineapple, and grapes with a strawberry yogurt dip. Only at Wendy's. It's better here. Since 1954, RBC's had mortgage specialists to help you with the right mortgage. The difference is, today they come to you, because you've got lots of things to do. Another way RBC puts you first. 
RBC Royal Bank. First for you. If your last encounter with fruit was on a Hawaiian shirt, you'll want to try this. Introducing the Fresh Fruit Bowl and Cup. Honeydew, cantaloupe, pineapple, and grapes with a strawberry yogurt dip. Only at Wendy's. It's better here. There was a time when making small purchases meant searching our pockets for change. But more and more of us are reaching for plastic and not just debit cards. As Melanie Nagy reports, small purchases are adding up to big business. Robert Cartwright hasn't seen a fistful of change like this in quite some time. That's because these days, most of his customers are paying with plastic. It used to be quite rare, and uh, now I'd say we make... Uh, maybe 15 or 20 transactions like that a day. Until recently, this coffee shop didn't accept credit cards for purchases under $5. But consumer demand changed all that. Now, whether it's a $3 sandwich or 99 cent dessert, there's no purchase too small for plastic. That's just what credit card companies want to hear. Like any other opportunity, it represents an opportunity to us. And it's, it's, uh, it's a matter of providing consumers with uh, the payment option uh, within the retailer community. And so it represents an opportunity that we're, we're eager to support. Eager to support because profits from small transactions are nothing but big. In the United States, more than a trillion in cash is spent every year on purchases under $5. Here in Canada, the number is estimated to be in the billions. It's big business for credit card companies. That means competition is fierce. The debit card challenges the credit card. It cuts into the credit card market, so the credit card companies had to, in, to look at expanding their existing market. To do so, credit card companies are making it easier to charge anything and everything. But that ease comes with a cost. Many merchants must pay a hefty fee every time a credit card is used. That cuts into their profit margin. And for consumers... Really, the cost of that uh, item, when you use a credit card, could also include interest charges. And you know what? Except you have pristine credit, you would likely be charged 18.5% interest. So far, the move into this new market appears to be working. The number of credit card purchases under $5 is growing at a record rate. There are now three times as many transactions today as there were just five years ago. So for credit card companies, replacing this with this is a money-making trend they hope will continue. Melanie Nagy, CBC News, Vancouver. Forbes magazine has issued its new list of the world's richest people. Number one for the 11th year in a row, Microsoft founder Bill Gates with a net worth of more than $46 billion U.S. Number two is American investor Warren Buffett. The owner of an Indian steel manufacturer comes in third. And the fourth richest businessman is the Mexican owner of a telecom company. Closed captioning of this program is brought to you by CBC. Those huge freighters that cluster around our seaports might look majestic, but what's less obvious is the impact they're having on the air we breathe. In Vancouver, the country's largest port, those ships spew as much pollution as all the cars and trucks on the roads combined. And as Bell Puri reports, it's getting worse. Canada's busiest port is busier than ever. Last year, Vancouver welcomed a record 2,600 cargo ships. This year it's sailing toward another banner year, but we can also expect something else to happen. The uh, marine sources of pollution are expected to overtake car, cars and light duty trucks as being the uh, main source of, of uh, smog causing pollutants. Container ships bring much more than just cargo to our shores. The most recent studies show ocean-going vessels are responsible for 58% of nitrogen compounds in the air, 82% of soot, and 95% of sulfur compounds which cause smog and acid rain. 
One freighter, according to the reports, can produce as much sulfur dioxide as almost 2,000 vehicles driving for a year. Canada and the United States are talking about a West Coast sulfur emissions control area, but international agreements like that can take years. In the meantime, increased trade with Asia means North American ports are booming, not just here, but all the way from San Diego to Prince Rupert. In Los Angeles, environmentalists refused to wait for a change in the law, so they went to court to ensure recent port expansion in that city was environmentally sound, and they won. Plug it in. Last June, Los Angeles unveiled the world's first use of alternative maritime power technology for container ships. Instead of burning diesel fuel while docked, the newly adapted vessels plug into onshore electrical power. It's a system that cuts emissions by a million tons per ship. At the port of Vancouver, authorities are not rushing to follow LA's lead. Instead, they've hired an emissions specialist to work on tougher global regulations for fear that going it alone will chase ships away. Ports want a level playing field. They don't want to create disadvantages to any particular port. In the next few years, container trade in Vancouver is projected to grow 7%. Experts say what's already bad is about to get worse. Emissions from marine vessels as a whole are expected to increase uh, about 50% between the years 2000 and 2025. It's hard not to notice the smog hanging over the region, and it appears a fix won't come anytime soon. Belle Puri, CBC News, Vancouver. And that is Canada Now for this Thursday, March 10th. I'm Ian Hannah Mansing. See you tomorrow. CBC Television, Canada's own.